Please give a warm welcome this morning to Dr. Ken Ham. Well, good morning. Well, I, I could hardly hear that. Well, it's great to have you all here. And you have to get used to me speaking because I tell people I have a deep southern accent. It's different to your southern accent down here. I wouldn't want to speak like that. I want, I want to maintain the one that I uh, actually obtained from Australia. Actually, I didn't have an accent until I came to America. And then for some reason, it must be the air you breathe, whatever it is, suddenly people say, you've got an accent. But the good thing about having an Australian accent in America is that people tell me it doesn't matter what you say, we just love to hear you saying it. So I, I can get away with anything. Well, I come from a ministry called Answers in Genesis, and we're just thrilled that uh, Dr. Pettit uh, would invite us to this university. Actually, you know, it's very sad, but there are not many university, Christian universities even, that will take a stand on God's Word from the book of Genesis right through and this university does and we praise the Lord for that well this is the age of social media and so we're using a hashtag which a lot of you young people will know how to use the older generation you can ask the younger ones hashtag BJUAIG and if you're uh, on Twitter and so on we would encourage you to go there and uh, actually uh, be able to tell people some of the things that you learn here this morning and uh, let them know. Uh, the secularists really don't like me doing this. Every time I speak to young people like this, they go crazy on my Facebook and Twitter and all upset that we're actually teaching you some information that they don't want you to hear. And uh, so that's why we like to get as many of you out there telling them what you've heard uh, so that they get to hear it. Answers in Genesis is an apologetics organization and by apologetics organization, what we mean is that we teach people how to defend the Christian faith. And one of my favorite verses of scripture is 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to give an answer or, or, or to give a defense. And that word answer, defense, comes from the Greek word apologia, from which we get our word apologetic. So our ministry is an apologetics ministry. Apologetics meaning to give a logical reason defense of the faith. And one of the things that I found today is that Many people in our churches, many young people, might know about the gospel, might know about the Bible, but do they really know how to defend their faith against the secular attacks of our day? That's one of the reasons we built the Creation Museum. How many of you, for interest, have been to the Creation Museum already? Wow, there's a lot of hands across this room. That is great. And how many of you have already been to the Ark Encounter? Oh, there's a number of you. The rest of you need to repent of your sin and get there as soon as you can. If you've been to the Creation Museum, you'll know that the Creation Museum actually is not just about creation and about creation evolution. It's actually a walk through the Bible, a walk through what we call the seven seas of history, creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion. That's the geological, biological, astronomical, anthropological uh, history of the universe that the world says is not true. And what we're telling you here is that history is true. The history in geology, biology, astronomy, anthropology, that history is true. And science confirms that history. And then the gospel based on that history is true. Actually, our message is quite simple. Every one of the presentations I give, I have the same message. You know what it is? The history in the Bible is true. That's why the gospel based on that history is true. And that's what the Creation Museum is all about. And we use life-size exhibits and walk people through the Bible, have a planetarium, special effects theater. It's an incredible facility. It's a themed attraction, a Christian-themed attraction. And there's nothing else like it actually in the world and people walk through that they experience the bible they get answers to skeptical questions and understand the bible's history is true that's why the gospel based in that history is true and we have a petting zoo and zip lines and all sorts of fun things for us to do you know people have said to me over the past few years why do you have zip lines at the creation museum and the ark by the way and you know what my answer is well christians can have fun too right we can have fun. we can even have fun here this morning learning about uh, creation, learning about geology and biology. And then the Ark Encounter, a life-size Noah's Ark, one and a half times the length of a football field, three decks of exhibits, built 15 feet off the ground, stands seven stories high, 10 stories high at the bow end. And you can walk through the entire Ark, walk through all three decks, and you'll see all these exhibits, teaching exhibits, themed exhibits. And we get a lot of non-Christians who come in there, and they're challenged. Because what we're doing is disseminating information to the world that is just not available in many other places.
because it's censored from the education system in the public schools, for instance, and from secular universities. You know, it's interesting, uh, you often hear that, oh, at universities, you know, academic institutions, they pride themselves in uh, being able to think critically and, you know, uh, uh, listening to all views and academic freedom. But you know what we find in this day and age? What they mean by academic freedom is they hear everything, but they're not allowed to hear anything Christian. That's about how, how it is these days. And, you know, we get accused of being intolerant, but I find the people who accuse us of being intolerant are the most intolerant people of all. <laughs> it's like people who say, well, you need to tolerate all beliefs. Well, what about our belief? The Bible's right and the other beliefs are wrong. Oh, no, we don't allow that because we allow all beliefs. Well, you see what's happening, don't you? It's a, a worldview clash, and that's what it's all about. And, of course, our whole emphasis at the Ark, as well as at the museum, is that as Noah and his family went through a door to be saved, we need to go through a door to be saved, and that door is the Lord Jesus Christ. I said to you that my, one of my favorite verses of Scripture is 1 Peter 3.15. Always be prepared to give an answer. When I was a high school teacher in Australia, one of the first lessons that I taught, students said to me, Sir, we heard you're a Christian. I said, Yes. How can you be a Christian when we know the Bible's not true? And I said, How do you know the Bible's not true? Well, because of what we're taught in our textbooks about evolution and millions of years. And right then I realized that for those young people, the teaching of evolution and millions of years was a real stumbling block to them even listening to the gospel and hearing uh, what the Bible has to say. And so I started to teach them how to think about science and you know, the difference between observational science, using your five senses in the present that develops our technology, and then talking about historical science, beliefs about the past. And I found these students had all sorts of questions. In fact, if I, as I've gone all over the world in the past 40 years, people ask the same basic questions. They're the same questions I were asking when I was a teacher. Well, how do you know there's a God? And where did God come from? Well, wait a minute. How could Noah get those animals on the ark? And don't we see evolution because we see natural selection? And aren't the fossils millions of years old? And, and so the questions go on. And so what I developed uh, was a way of teaching the students answers to those questions uh, teaching them apologetics, even in the public schools. I had the freedom back then to do that. And, you know, I've heard many testimonies from some of those students many years later, 40 years later, who said that that really challenged them and a number of them that have committed their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what I want to do with you as young people is this. See, I, I've even been to churches where I've talked to young people, youth groups, and I've said, you believe in God? Yes. Well, how do you know there's a God? Well, I guess it's by faith. And I say, what sort of faith? Well, I guess it's blind faith. I tell you, I tear my hair out. No, it is not blind faith. It's the atheists have, that have blind faith. Christians don't have a blind faith. If, by faith, yes, because we're finite beings. But it's a faith that makes sense of what we see and a faith that's confirmed by science. And that's what I wanted to deal with here this morning. So I thought what we'd do is we'd run through a number of these questions and we'll see if we can get through uh, most of these. Questions that I've been asked, questions I was asked as a public school teacher, questions that I get asked anywhere in the world where I go today, and, and just show you how you can answer these. Because again, I find many young people in our churches might know what they believe. Oh, we trust Christ for salvation. Uh, the Bible's the word of God. But, but wait a minute, the skeptical questions of this age, the attacks on the Bible, how do you know there's a God? How can you trust the Bible? Hasn't science disproved the Bible? How do you answer those? And that's what I find most young people don't know how to do that. Apologetics is missing from most of our churches, most of our Christian institutions, most of our uh, Christian homes. And so let me run through some of these. Now, each one of these, we could spend an hour or two or three on each question. I just want to give you a little summary and to help us understand that you can give answers to show you can logically defend the Christian faith. And so, first one here, is there any evidence for an infinite God? When somebody says to you, how do you know there's a God? Well, you know, Romans 1.20 tells us if you don't believe in God, you're without excuse because it's so obvious. Three years ago this month, I debated a man called Bill Nye, Bill Nye the science guy. I call him Bill Nye the uh, evolution guy, or Bill Nye the humanist guy. But Bill Nye and, and I debated at the Creation Museum. And one of the questions I asked Bill Nye was this. I said, now, if you believe everything came about by natural processes, for all intents and purposes, Bill Nye is really an atheist because he said everything comes about by natural processes. Okay, well, where did the laws of logic come from? I mean, how do we know that we can trust our logic? 
How do we know we don't have half logic right now? Where did the laws of nature come from? I mean, how come they're the same today as they were yesterday as they will be tomorrow? How could those laws of nature, the laws of chemistry and so on, how could they come about by natural processes? And, 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 and why do they stay the same? How do, you, how do you explain that if the whole universe came about by natural processes? Now, I remember one young man once when I was at a conference, he came up to me and he said, hey, sir, I heard you talk, but, you know, uh, he said, I still believe that we all came about by chance random processes. I said, oh, you do? Yes, sir. That's how I think we came about. I said, oh, okay, well, if you came about by chance random processes, that means your brain evolved by chance random processes, right? Well, I guess so, sir. Well, if your brain evolved by chance random processes, then your processes of logic evolved by chance random processes. If they evolved by chance random processes, son, you don't even know they evolved the right way. You don't even know if you're asking me the right question. And his response was, what was the name of that book you recommended? <laughs> so I think he got the point. But, you know, we could talk about the laws of logic, the laws of nature, the uniform of nature, uniformity of nature for the rest of the day. But uh, I, I just want to introduce that to you. But let's look at a couple of other things here. DNA, that molecule of, of heredity, that molecule of heredity that makes up our, our chromosomes, our genes. You know, the first two people who really discovered the helical structure of DNA were two scientists in England, Francis Crick and James Watson. And, and they're atheists, and they discovered uh, that... Uh, DNA structure and built their model back in 1953. Actually, that's important for me because I, I, I don't know what it is. It must be a man thing, but I, I, I have a trouble remembering my wife's birthday and anniversaries and things like that. And the only way I can remember when she was born is when did Watson and Crick discover the helical structure of DNA? That was 1953. And then, okay, what day is her birthday? Pearl Harbor Day was the 7th of December, so that's how I remember those things. And uh, I, I haven't figured one out for our wedding anniversary. I know we were married 40-something 40, 40 years ago anyway, I, I, I know. We just had an anniversary recently, but I'll have to find one for that. But they built this model. It's in a museum in London, and you can go and see the original model that they built. And you know what they said? They said, we wanted to show the world there's no God because they were atheists. We wanted to show that life is nothing but chemistry. There we are. There it is, the DNA molecule. That's it. Life is nothing but chemistry. Well, you know, we've done a lot of research on DNA, and we now know that DNA is not just chemistry. It's much more than chemistry. Here's a piece of rope, and that rope has blue and red beads on it that spell out the word help. You all agree with that, right? It spells out the word help. If you know the Morse code, it spells out the word help. If you don't know the Morse code, it's red and blue beads on a rope. Now, I like to use this as an analogy. Because, you see, if you know the code, you know the language system, you can uh, get that word there, help. In a sense, to help us understand, I, I'm a teacher, so I like to use analogies and, and sort of communicate big picture things to help us understand it. DNA is like two pieces of rope with beads on it, molecules, base pairs. And it spells out all the information that builds a cat or a dog or a human or whatever it is. When I went to university, my professor actually said, look, I'm going to prove to you there's no God. Let's get the letters of the alphabet and put them in a hat. By the way, I should have asked where the letters of the alphabet come from, but I didn't think of that at the time. So we put the letters of the alphabet in a hat, and then he passed the hat around the class and asked students to pull out letters, and three students pulled out B-A-T, bat. Oh, we got a word. We got a word by chance random processes. Given enough time, uh, we could get another word. Uh, given enough time, we could get sentences. Given enough time, uh, we could get the Encyclopedia Britannica. Now, he said, that, that might sound foolish to you and silly, but you must admit, there's always the possibility we could get the letters in, in the particular order, even though it, it's remote. And that's really what happened millions of years ago, is that uh, th these chemicals all came together, you know, these molecules came together by chance, random process, you just happened to get the right combination. Bingo, we got life. There's no God. Let's go on. Do you know what I should have said to my professor? That word, B-A-T, is that a word to a Frenchman or a Dutchman or an Englishman or a Chinese? Who is that a word to? It's only a word to somebody who already has the language. When I pick up my Bible here, it's in English. And if I didn't know English, but if this was in Russian, I wouldn't be able to read it because I don't have the code. But if I know the code, I can read it. And by the way, the other interesting thing is, when I read my Bible and get this information... Their ink was used to make letters that make words, that make sentences, 
and I read it and get information, but the information is not in the ink. The ink is arranged into letters and words according to a code. Actually, information is immaterial, but anyway, we won't get into that. That gets too difficult. But the point is, if you don't have the code, you won't understand the message. Now, you know what we found? DNA has a message, very complicated message. All the information, how to build a cat or a dog or a human, all the different life forms we have on Earth. But you have to have an inf a, a code system to read the information. Do you know that DNA has the information to make the code system to read the information? And if the, if the information is not there for the code system, it can't read the information. It's all got to be there or it won't work. How could that happen? Dr. Werner Gitt is a German scientist, and he's done a lot of research on information. In his book, In the Beginning Was Information, he says this, there is no known natural law through which matter can give rise to information. Students, if you can start to grasp this, do you know how much information is in living things on this earth? Zillions of bits of information. I mean, it's not just billions. I mean, it is, it's so extraordinary we, we can't even comprehend it. It's an enormous amount of information. Do you know we've never seen matter produce one bit of information? Do you realize if life evolved by natural processes, somehow matter by itself had to produce information? And, and, and it must be a law of nature. It would have to be a law of nature, right? Because there's so much information, it must have happened over and over and over again, millions and millions and millions of times. We've never seen it happen once. Not only that, Codes always come from an intelligence. Information only comes from information. Codes only come from an intelligence. Look, let me help you understand. Do you know how much information there is in, 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 in our genes? Just to, just to start to help you comprehend this a little bit. Has anyone here counted the number of atoms in the universe? Have, have you done that lately? Well, they estimate it to be 10 to the 80th power, one followed by 80 zeros. That's how many atoms they estimate are in the universe. You know how small an atom is. If you took one man and one woman from this audience, do you know how many children you could have without the same combination of information, without having two the same? It's that number. See, that sort of variability God put in, the, the, the cat kind, the dog kind, the human. I mean, there's an incredible amount of information in living things. Now, if you're going to believe in evolution like Bill Nye and you believe everything happened by natural processes somehow matter and of course then you can ask the question where did matter come from where did the laws of the universe come from where did the laws of logic come from I mean they ignore all those questions but somehow matter had to form a code system and had to form information and then over millions of years you supposedly get all this information zillions and uh, bits of information We've never seen matter produce a code, and we've never seen matter produce information. Evolution's impossible. In fact, it's ridiculous. You know, when you look at DNA, you know DNA really cries out, in the beginning God created. Hey, isn't it thrilling to be a Christian? Wow, there are three people thrilled. Three people in South Carolina are thrilled. Isn't it thrilling to be a Christian? Oh, isn't it exciting to be a Christian? It is. People, do you realize something? That's what the Bible says. If you don't believe in God, you're without excuse. Now, I know you're sitting there, and I know one of you, at least, is thinking this. Yeah, but what would Richard Dawkins say about that? You, you wanted to ask that question, didn't you? I mean, Richard Dawkins, that atheist, many, many years ago, in fact, it was, it was uh, quite a long time ago, uh, over 30 years ago, we had somebody who interviewed Richard Dawkins. So this is an old video, and it's a bit scratchy and, you know, old technology. But they asked him basically that question. Can you give one example, just one where you see new information added into the genes? Let's, let's see what he says. Professor Dawkins, can you give an example of a genetic mutation or an evolutionary process which can be seen to increase the information in the genome? Now, look, just in case you missed that, <laughs> let me show it again because it's my favorite part of the video and, and I really want you to hear his answer because there was too much noise last time and you might have missed it. Professor Dawkins, can you give an example of a genetic mutation or an evolutionary process which can be seen to increase the information in the genome? Now, I would say to you it's one of the rare times that atheist Richard Dawkins and I agree. 
there is no answer. Now think about this. We've got millions, billions, trillions, zillions of bits of information in living things. Give an example where matter produces one bit of information on its own. Brand new information. Now, I know you're sitting there and saying, yeah, but that was over 30 years ago. What would he say now? I knew you would ask that question. How many of you saw the Expel movie a number of years ago? Quite a lot of you. Well, if you remember in the Spell, Expel movie, Ben Stein, who was the host, was speaking to Richard Dawkins. And, and I want you to listen uh, to the question he asked here because he basically says, you know, is it possible that life could have been designed? And, of course, Richard Dawkins is an atheist. He says there's no God. Everything came about by natural processes. So let's listen to his answer. What do you think is the possibility that, there, that intelligent design might turn out to be uh, the answer to some issues in uh, genetics or in, well, or in evolution? It could come about in the following way. It could be that uh, at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization e evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this, this planet. Oh, of course Richard Dawkins is prepared to believe in a designer, as long as it's an alien. Now think about that for a moment. Oh yes, I believe that it's very possible life was designed and seeded on Earth by aliens. Okay, so they must have come from a planet somewhere. How did those aliens come about? I think his answer would have to be, there was another planet that had aliens. And they seeded life on that planet to produce the aliens that came to this planet. Oh, where did those other aliens come from? There was another planet. You know, I really think Richard Dawkins would be very happy to believe in eternal aliens, but not an eternal God. <laughs> it just shows you that they'll do anything but believe the truth. And you know why? Because if there is a creator God who made us, who owns us, he sets the rules. It means marriage is a man and a woman. It means abortion is killing a human being. It means you need to submit to God. It means you're a sinner in need of salvation. And, and of course, Romans 1 makes it very clear that th th these people who reject God as creator, you know what it says? They suppress the truth and unrighteousness. It's so obvious as a God. God has made it evident to all, as Romans 1 tells us, as we started off with here this morning. And so they suppress the truth. That's what Richard Dawkins does. He has to suppress the truth. You know what he's really doing? Putting his hands over his ears, his hands over his eyes, and he says, I refuse to hear. I refuse to see. There's, there's no God. I'll believe anything but that. I want you to understand what's happening here. This is their blind faith religion to try to justify rejecting the God of creation. Let's go on and see what else he says. Um, now, th that is a possibility and an intriguing possibility. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail, details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some <laughs> sort of designer by the way, you do find a signature of some sort of designer. It's called DNA, a language system and an information system. And he knows that signature is there, but he would rather attribute it to aliens than to an eternal God. Wait a second. Richard Dawkins thought intelligent design might be a legitimate pursuit? Um, and that designer could well be a higher intelligence from elsewhere in the universe. Well, but that higher intelligence would itself have had to have come about by some explicable or ultimately explicable process. It couldn't have just jumped into existence spontaneously. That's the point. So Professor Dawkins was not against intelligent design, just certain types of designers, such as God. And that's it. That's what, what he's against. He refuses to believe in the God of creation. You know, that's why I want us to understand something here. I said, I meet young people who think Christianity is a blind faith. No, Richard Dawkins has a blind faith. The secularists have a blind faith. The atheists have a blind faith because observational science does not confirm their faith. Observational science, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Observational science confirms the first verse of the Bible. 
When you look at DNA, when you look at biochemistry, a language system, an information system, when you consider the laws of logic, the laws of nature, it's very obvious in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth is what makes sense of the world. Observational science uh, confirms that. You know, I said to you the reason that they reject God is because they don't want to believe they're in submission to God. So what happens when you die as far as Richard Dawkins is concerned? You know, there was an article recently, and it was in New Scientist, and it was headed, A Meaning of Life, How a Sense of Purpose Can Keep You Healthy. And there was a statement in here, because when I had Bill Nye at the Ark a few months ago, and I, I took him through the Ark, a two-hour walk through the Ark, and we videoed it all, by the way. And one of the questions I said to him, but Bill, what's the point of you even arguing against creationists? And, and what's the point of you doing what you're doing? Because from your perspective, what happens when you die? He says, when you die, you're done. I said, well, if you, when you die, you're done. What's the point of doing what you're doing? Oh, because there might be some great scientific advancements to help people for the future. I said, but when they die, they're done. And if, if they die, they're done. What's the point of what you did? And it was interesting to read in this article this statement. This is a new scientist just recently, in January, actually. As human beings, it is hard for us to shake the idea that our existence must have significance beyond the here and now. Life begins and ends, yes, but surely there is a greater meaning. The trouble is, these stories we tell ourselves do nothing to soften the harsh reality as far as the universe is concerned. We are nothing but fleeting and randomly assembled collections of energy and matter. One day we will all be dust. One day, but not yet, just because life is ultimately meaningless doesn't stop us searching for meaning while we're alive. And then they go on to say, if you do exercise and get healthy, it helps purpose and meaning. I want you to understand something. That is the message of our secular education system. That is the message of our secular university system. Generations of young people like yourself are being told you're nothing but a randomly assembled collection of molecules. When you die, that's the end of you. Is it any wonder we see violence and suicide and turning to drugs and sex and whatever, whatever you can do in the moment? Because that's the hopelessness of the evolutionist position. Do you realize that atheistic evolution is really the pagan religion of this age to explain life without God? That's what it is. And you know the sad thing? So many church leaders, just like the religious leaders in the days of the Israelites that you read about in the minor prophets, for instance, and even Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah however you say it, and Jeremiah, many of, the, many of the, the, those religious leaders adopted the pagan religion of the age and compromised God's word, and, and it destroyed them. And people, that's happening today, right across the church in this nation. Now, then I have people say, and I had this at school. Well, Mr. Ham, who made God? Oh, mm. how do you answer that? A little boy once at a conference came up to me. He was about nine, ten years old. And he looked up at me and said, Mr. Ham, then how do I answer who made God? Who made God? I looked at him and thought, how, how do you answer a nine-year-old like that? So I said, so I thought to myself, it's the same way you answer the PhDs in our universities too secular PhDs. Who made God? I said, well, son, if somebody made God, you'd have to have a bigger God who made God, right? Yes, sir. Well, now you've got a problem. Yes, sir. Well, who made the bigger God? You'd have to have a bigger, bigger God who made the bigger God who made God, right? Yes, sir. Well, now you've got a problem. Yeah, I know. Who made the bigger, bigger God? You'd have to have a bigger, bigger, bigger God who made the bigger, bigger God who made the big God who made God, right? Yes, sir. Now you've got a problem. I know. Who made the bigger, bigger, bigger God? You'd have to have bigger, 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 bigger God made the bigger, bigger, bigger God made the bigger, bigger God made the big God made God, right? Yes, sir. Well, now you've got to, I know. <laughs> and I said, you realize you can keep going back all you want, just like Richard Dawkins, aliens and more aliens and more aliens and more aliens. <laughs> you, you have to have a, a, a bigger God and a bigger, bigger God. You know, the only thing that makes sense and makes sense of the laws of logic and the laws of nature and makes sense of the universe the very first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created. A God who is outside of time. Young people, I want you to understand this. We are finite beings. 
So we can never understand that. The Bible says God is an infinite creator. He's outside of time. We were created in time. He created time for us to exist in. We are finite created beings. That's why the Bible says without faith it's impossible. But it's not blind faith. That's what I want you to understand. It's a faith that makes sense of what we see as confirmed by science. And you know what? This book claims to be a record from the one who knows everything who says, I want to tell you where you came from, what's happened in the past, who you are, what your problem is, what the solution is. And as we take this book, which is really a history book, it's God's history book to us, it makes sense of the world. Yes, if you don't believe in God, you're without excuse. And so let's look at some other areas as we go on here. One of the questions I remember being asked at school was, Hey, sir, how can Noah fit all those species of animals on the ark? And I, I've heard that from secularists over and over again on my Facebook page. You, you know, how can Noah fit all the species of animals on the ark? There's too many species. Well, first of all, the word species is a man-made arbitrary term. See, that is the wrong question to ask. And it's not all the species of animals. It was only land animals. So if you want to ask the question correctly, it would be, how could Noah fit all the kinds of land animals on the ark? You know, in Genesis 6, we read that two of every kind or sort, seven of some, went on Noah's ark. And that comes from the Hebrew word min. So what, what does God's classification system here, what does it really mean? Because... The Bible makes it clear that this event of, of Noah's ark really happened and two of each kind, seven of some of the land animal kinds went on board the ark. In Genesis 1, we read the phrase that God made the animals and plants after his kind, after their kind. Ten times we read that. Now, in man's classification system, that finite man, fallible man has invented, we have kingdom, farm, class, order, family, genus, species. And what we would say is from the research that we've done and our scientists have done, in the majority of instances, not all, but the majority, the kind that the Bible talks about really would be more at the family level of classification, not genus, not species in most instances. Sometimes order, but mainly family. You see, what our scientists have done, they did this for the Ark Project, because we wanted to have an exhibit on how many animals were really needed on Noah's Ark. And actually... We've come to the conclusion, at the most, and this is way overestimating. So we way overestimate, uh, and it's about 1,400 kinds. So nowhere near as many animals as people think. But here's how they did their research. Dogs are, are, are one that there's a lot of research being done on dogs. And so we can see, you know, different species of dogs. You've got dingoes and coyotes and jackal and pennants and foxes and your domestic varieties of dogs and your degenerate mutants like poodles and all, all sorts of things. So what, what you can do and what they've done is, oh, we do, this species bred with that one and this one with this one and this one with this one and this one with this one. They look at this documentation all around the world. This one didn't breed with this one, but it did breed that, that, that bred with that, that bred with that, that did breed with that. You get the idea? And they connect all that together and say, that's obviously one kind. Now, obviously, for the fossil examples, you can't see them breed, and that's why we, we overestimate. Uh, and unless we've been able to document them breeding together, like with bats, there's probably only one kind of bat. But because we haven't seen that happen, we allow for a number of different kinds just to overestimate. People overestimating, there's 1,400 kinds, nowhere near as many animals as what people think. So when you look at our classification system, for instance, there's one dog family, we'd say there's one dog kind, different genera, different species. One cat family, uh, different genera, different species. And so when it comes to dogs, we've got all these different species of dogs and even our domestic varieties. Now, when you look at forming different species, in the public school textbooks, it talks about natural selection, and they equate natural selection and speciation with evolution. I'm going to tell you natural selection, what's happening with what we call natural selection, is the opposite of the evolutionary process. See, the molecules to man evolutionary process involves matter, forming a code system, information system, and then, you sp and then you get more and more information for new characteristics that weren't previously possible. Look, to help us understand what's really going on with natural selection, l let me do it this way, because I'm going to tell you, if you correctly understand it, it's the opposite of molecules to man evolution. It blew my mind as a teacher, the teachers in the other classrooms were telling kids, 
Natural selection is part of evolution, and this is proof. When you see different species forming, look at Darwin's finches. This is all evidence for evolution. I was telling my kids, this is evidence against evolution. So let me help you understand it from a big picture perspective. Here are two dogs God made. We didn't have any dogs he made originally. Let's say he made two. And they got married and had kids, they got married and had kids, and they got married and had kids, and we ended up with lots of dogs. Okay. Pretty technical stuff, this. Now, even though it's much more technical than this, much more complex, even our PhD in molecular genetics, Dr. Georgia Purdom at Answers in Genesis, uses the same slides I do to give you the big picture. And so we're going to use capital, letter, capital letters for dominant genes, uh, little letters for recessive genes. That is way oversimplifying. But you know what? What we really need to do is just understand the big picture because the big picture is accurate as to what's really going on. And, and sometimes we complicate things too much and so we don't get the big picture. Now, there are millions of these, but this just gives you an idea. So here we have a male and female dog, big A, little A, big B, little B, big C, little C, and they have an offspring, two big A's, two big B's, two big C's. I want you to notice something. The information here came from these two dogs. But it's going to look different to the parents because it has a different combination of information. You look different to your parents, but all the information came from your parents, but you have a different combination of information. By the way, do you know that's important when it comes to the abortion issue? Did you know when sperm fertilizes egg, there's a unique combination of information different to the mother, different to the father, and no new information is added, which means you're 100% human right then. And the Bible says humans are made in the image of God. And so just from that perspective alone, abortion is obviously killing a human being. Now, you can get other combinations. I like to use the little A's, little B's, little C's to represent um, you know, what we call our purebred dogs, like poodles. They're not pure in the sense you think of pure. It just means, you know, how do we get those purebred dogs? Oh, here's a dog with a short nose, a dog with a short nose. Let's breed them together, get rid of the genes for long-nosed dogs and, and all the rest of it. And so you're getting rid of information and concentrating information. And because of 6,000 years of the curse and sin causes all sorts of problems and mistakes, you're also concentrating mutations, which is why those, those little purebred dogs usually cost you millions of dollars to keep alive because they, they basically wouldn't be here if it wasn't for sin. Now, so I want you to have a look at this. Let's say this is a poodle. Two little A's, two little B's, two little C's. If you breed poodles with poodles, what are you going to end up with? Poodle. Isn't that sad? <laughs> I mean, that's all you can get. See, they are the end of the line in dogs. I mean, if they lose any more information, they're gone. <laughs> now, I want you to think about this. Could you start with poodles and breed back to the original dogs? No, you can't because you don't have all the original information. Could you theoretically start with these dogs and eventually, again, not that you want to, but eventually get poodles? And the answer is theoretically yes. You see what I'm saying? Now, remember, 10 to the 80th atoms in the universe, if you took one man and one woman, that's how many children you could have without having two with the same combination of information. Young people, start to grasp this. This, this is what the secularists don't get. This is what the kids in the public schools don't understand. There's incredible pools of information. God made a pool of information for the dog kind, the cat kind, the elephant kind. He took two of each kind, seven of some, on board Noah's Ark. And because of the incredible amount of variability that's already there in the genes, as they come off the ark, over time, what happens? They uh, build up in population and move away from each other, and you get all sorts of different combinations that survive in different areas in different ways for different reasons, and you end up with different species, which is the opposite of evolution. You see, for, for those who believe in, in, in evolution, you start with no code, no information. Over millions of years, you've got to get all this information. Do you know what we notice? Do you know what we observe in genetics? Conservation of information, new combinations of information, loss of information, massive amounts of information. It goes totally against the evolutionary worldview. Observational science confirms you've got all these pools of information that God put there. Let me help you understand further. These are the two dogs that got on board Noah's Ark. S gene for short hair, L for long hair. Together they are medium hair length. They fell in love. 
Okay, there are only two of them. So, And then they have an offspring. Oh, look, it's got something new. Here's how they indoctrinate kids in the, in the education system. Something new is evolution. Oh, look at Darwin's finches. Over here on the mainland, uh, you've got these finches, but there's new species in the Galapagos, and they've got these different sized beaks. That's new. That's evolution. I want you to have a look here. What's new? Short hair. What's not new? New information. In fact, it's got less information than the parents. It's just a new combination of information that already existed. Then you have one that's the same, and then, oh, look, something new. Oh, look, we've got these finches in the Galapagos have big beaks. Wow, that's evolution. You've got these dogs that have long hair. Why do they have long hair? They've got less information than the parents, longer hair than the parents. And you see, what they call natural selection, see what's happening here? Conservation of information, loss of information, new combinations of information, but not new, brand new information. Now, what they call natural selection, adaptation, and speciation, here's what happens. Give you the big picture. Dogs go towards a cold climate. In a cold climate, what happens? Those with short hair and medium hair get cold. And then they die. <laughs> and now you're only left with dogs with long hair. Hey, we've got a new species or something, you know. And then there are those that go towards a hot climate. In a hot climate, medium hair, long hair, overheat, and they die. And now you're left with dogs with only short hair. What's new? It's a new combination of already existing information, less variability than the parents. That's the opposite of evolution. Natural selection, adaptation, and speciation, it's the opposite of a molecules-to-man evolutionary process that requires new information. And so over time you get different species forming. And so we get all our different species of dogs. We get our different species of galliforms. And so it goes on. And so what I use with Bill Nye, I said, look, evolutionists believe in one tree of life, one tree. We're all related. Did you know you're related to plants? From an evolutionist perspective, you're related to bananas. Bananas. I have to keep translating over here. So... Bill Nye believes in one tree, Every, everything is related, and we see all these different species within kinds on this tree. But you see, what we're saying is, no, God created an orchard, the dog kind, the cat kind, the elephant kind. Because of all the information in the genes, you can have different species, but there are boundaries, and one kind doesn't change into another. Noah didn't need all the species on the ark, just the kinds. We have a, a, a DVD out. Actually, we have a special for you, but, which we always do for young people because I, I so want to equip them. Uh, we have some pocket guides that, that are normally $6 each that we let you have for a dollar each today. And we have videos that are anywhere from $14 to $20. We let you have for $2 each today. And this is one of them. It has uh, a number of animated, uh, six animated videos on there. I want to show you one of them because they really help teach some of these things. So let's watch this short video. You hear this one a lot. Science has proven evolution, therefore evolution is true. Since evolution is true and Christians don't believe it, then Christians don't believe science and they aren't rational people. Really, let's put that claim to the test. First off, evolution in the sense that things change is evident. No rational person disputes that. Therefore, rational Christians believe it. We can observe change, but evolution in the sense that life came from non-life and then that life began to randomly generate new genetic information and over time it eventually produced humans is something entirely different and something that quite honestly doesn't hold up against science. In other words, evolution in the sense of molecules to man is not scientifically plausible and therefore should not be viewed as scientific fact. Quite honestly, it is in great opposition to science, that is, observational science, the kind of science we can test and repeat and use our five senses to understand. Science demonstrates that over time, Living organisms lose genetic information. They don't gain it. That same science demonstrates that life doesn't arise from non-life. Hey, Follow along from? if you would. Fact one, there is no known observable process by which new genetic information can be added to an organism's genetic code. 
None. That pretty much refutes evolution right away because there's no way to go from a fish to an amphibian without adding new information, right? If living organisms cannot produce new genetic information, how can anything gradually change into something of higher intelligence or form or complexity? That is, how can anything evolve from an amoeba to a man without adding new genetic information? The answer, of course, is that it can't. Plain and simple. Now, some have speculated and they have imagined all kinds of things and they brought in artists to produce creative renderings based on guesses and they have been successful in telling a very convincing story that humans evolved from ape-like creatures. But those are just drawings, people. They're just stories. But what we really observe is humans are humans and apes are apes. Now, if fact one buried evolutionary thinking deep into the Precambrian soil, this next fact, fact two, tosses so much sediment on it that not even the greatest team of paleontologists with the latest subterranean gizmo could dig up the remains. Check this out. Never, again, never has it been observed that life can come from non-life. So here are two major scientific evidences against evolution. I reiterate for clarity, life has never been observed to come from non-life, and there is no known, observable process by which new genetic information can be added to the genetic code of an organism. So molecules demand evolution doesn't really make scientific sense. Yet we are all here, and life is all around us in various forms. Although evolution cannot account for this, the Bible can. The Bible reveals that the all-powerful, all-knowing, supernatural God created the heavens and the earth out of nothing, and all life according to its kinds, that is, each with its own set of genetic information. So, again, what the Bible reveals makes sense of what we see and understand. Evolution does not. Enough said. There we are. Simple, isn't it? Hey, when you understand that, you'll never think the same again, and you'll realize evolution is impossible. You know, at the Creation Museum, we actually have a display with what are called Darwin's finches. And these are used in the textbooks as the classic example of evolution. Finches on the mainland, they're different species than the Galapagos. By the way, they're still finches. What were they? Finches. What will they be? Finches. Is that evolution? It's just finches. Right beside the display of Darwin's finches, we actually have a display of dog skulls. Do you realize there's more variation in those dog skulls that evolutionists would never use as an example of evolution? There's more variation there than there is in those finches. And yet because Darwin found these finches on the Galapagos, uh, then you know, that's, that's the holy grail of evolution and so on. And yet there's more variation in those dog skulls. When Darwin drew his pictures... And you can see the finches and the beaks there. He drew that little tree that you can see there. And, and in a way, we would agree with that tree. And that is that all these finches are related because they're all the one kind, just different species. But then, of course, Darwin went on to say it's all part of the big tree, which would say that's simply not true and not what you observe. Many of you have probably heard of Ray Comfort, who has a ministry in California, and he really does a lot to go out there and challenge uh, secularist with the gospel message and he produced a dvd a few years ago called evolution versus god and he interviewed a number of professors and students at secular universities in california i want you to see how brainwashed they are how indoctrinated they are because when he asked them for an example of evolution of one kind changing into a different kind we're not talking about speciation we're talking about evolution in the sense of reptiles to birds one kind into a totally different kind Guess what example they gave over and over again? The classic example of Darwin's finches. I want you to listen to what happened. When you say change of kinds, you mean the evolution of one species from another or to another. Yes, we have that in action actually in the Galapagos. Could you give me one instance? Yes, we have an example from a group of birds called Darwin's finches. And you take a look at the difference between the finches on the islands that all started out. I mean, that's very, very observable. But that's not Darwinian evolution. There's been no change of kinds. What did the finches become? They become genetically new and anatomically new, recognizably different species. So they're still finches? Well, of course they're still finches, yes. So they're not a change of, there's no change of kind. The little birds that he, uh, that he had observed... That, oh, what did they become? Um, their beaks, their beak shapes. They're their still colors. birds? Yes. Three finches that turn into different types of birds. Based they're on still the finches. Beak. Well, for example, Darwin and, and his study on evolution of uh, the birds on the island that he went on to there. Their beaks changed? Their beaks. Uh, yeah, they're still birds. There's no change of kinds. They're still birds. There's no change in kinds. In fact, they're still finches. Hey, do you know what I'm telling you? Observational science in genetics confirms an orchard, separate kinds, variation within a kind, representing the incredible genetic potential God put there with all the pools of information. That's what observational science confirms, does not confirm the one tree, the evolutionary tree, 
Hey, you know what? Isn't it exciting to be a Christian? Oh, that time we got 40 people excited. We're getting better here. Wow. I'm, I'm trying to find out how to, how to get people in South Carolina really excited about God's Word. Okay, so let's go on then. Okay, you believe in Noah's Ark. He didn't need near the number of animals on the ark. He could fit them all in. It wasn't a problem. Most animals are pretty small anyway. There's tons of room on the ark. But now, now that means you believe there's a global flood. Yes. Is there any evidence for a global flood? Actually... If, you, if there was a global flood, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And you know what we find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. The interesting thing to me is the secularists propose what they call a flood of biblical proportions on Mars in its history because there's evidence there was water on Mars. There's no liquid water on Mars. They're happy to propose a flood of what they call biblical proportions on Mars where there's no liquid water and they refuse to have a flood of biblical proportions on Earth where it's 70% covered by water. Why is that? Because the flood on Earth is in the Bible. (laughs) If the Bible said there was a flood on Mars, they would say there never was a flood on Mars. They'll do anything but believe the Bible. Now, I couldn't bring our geologist with us this weekend, Dr. Andrew Snelling has a PhD in geology from Sydney University. He's done a lot of research over the years. He's one of the leading creation geologists. So I brought him on video, and after he finishes here on this video, I'll then explain a couple of things in a little bit more detail to you. But I, I want to show you this because the majority of our young people today do not hear this sort of information. It is censored from them. The secularists don't want them to hear this because as soon as they do, they realize, wait a minute. That that means the millions of years can't be true. What are some of the best flood evidences? If the flood really did occur, what evidence would we look for? You know, most people haven't even thought of that question, let alone thought of an answer. You know, the Bible says that the fountains of the great deep were opened, the rain fell from heaven for 40 days and 40 nights, the waters rose 150 days until all the high hills under the whole of the heaven were covered and the mountains were covered. And we're told that all land-dwelling, air-breathing life perished except for those on the ark. Wouldn't we expect to find billions of dead plants and animals buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth? And that's exactly what we find. Billions of dead things called fossils buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. But let's expand on that. Let's look at six of the best evidences for the flood. Evidence number one, sea creatures buried high in mountains on the continents. That's right, marine creatures that live in the ocean are found in mountains like the Himalayas. How did they get there? Unless the ocean waters rose up over the continents. And we find marine creatures in rock layers all over the continents everywhere around the world. Evidence number two, we'd find rapidly buried plants and animals. Well, we do, fossils. We find fossils not only of plants, but of bees, of bats. We find fish that uh, haven't finished having their breakfast eating another fish they're buried and fossilized ichthyosaurs giving birth to babies and they're fossilized. We find delicately preserved fossilized jellyfish. How do you fossilize a jellyfish slowly? Evidence number three, rapidly deposited sediment layers right across the continents. We find that everywhere we look. Look at the red wall limestone, full of fossils in the Grand Canyon. Yet the same limestone layer is found in the same position over in Pennsylvania. Then over in England, and even in the Himalayas, the chalk beds, the White Cliffs of Dover, we find the same chalk beds in Europe, in the Middle East, over into Kazakhstan, we find the same chalk beds with the same fossils in Texas and the Midwestern United States, we find the same chalk beds in Western Australia. The coal beds of Pennsylvania and West Virginia are also found in in England and Europe, right across to the Ural Mountains. Evidence number four, long transport distance of sediments. The Coconino sandstone in the Grand Canyon. The sand grains are believed to have been eroded and washed from it far north as at least Wyoming. The Navajo sandstone in Zion National Park, those huge white cliffs. The sand grains are believed to have been eroded and washed all the way from the Appalachians right across North America. Evidence number five, rapid or no erosion between uh, sediment layers. Again, think in terms of the uh, Coconino sandstone and the Hermit Shale. It's a, there's a knife edge 
flat, featureless boundary between those two rock layers for mile after mile through the Grand Canyon. Yet the geologists claim that there's 10 million years missing at that boundary. What would have happened during 10 million years of weathering and erosion? You'd get a topography, not a flat, featureless boundary. The bottom of the Grand Canyon, the Tapete Sandstone sits on the pre-flood rocks and we have evidence of huge erosion there with boulders being picked up from the underlying rock layers indicating rapid erosion. Evidence number six, we find whole rock layer sequences deposited rapidly in quick succession. Look at the walls of the Grand Canyon, from the tapetes at the bottom to the Kaibab limestone at the top, supposed to be representing 300 million years of slow and gradual sedimentary deposition. When the plateau was pushed up, those rock layers were bent and folded but they were folded without fracturing. They had to be soft if they were bent without fracturing. That means that they could only have just have been deposited. But that means the 300 million years never happened. All those rock layers had to be rapidly deposited in quick succession during the flood year. So you see, when you ask the right question, you get the right answers. Who are we going to believe? The scientists who weren't there, who don't know everything, who sometimes make mistakes? or the word of God who was there, who saw what happened and told us what happened during the flood. And what we see in God's world agrees with what we read in God's word. Do you know that most university students, most high school students have never heard that sort of information? It really is censored from them. And people, you know what happens? Generations of young kids, even from the church, go to public schools, go to second universities, and the information they're given, which is in many instances, a lot of false information about the origin history of life causes many of them to doubt the Bible and many of them end up walking away from the church. That's why it's so important for us to make sure that we are, are, are equipped to be able to defend the Christian faith and that we get training to enable us to recognize how the secularists think, how to critically uh, think about uh, their worldview and how to defend the Christian worldview. And that's why I'm very much a supporter of Christian institutions like uh, Bob Jones University. You know, Mount St. Helens, uh, Dr. Snelling mentioned that when interrupted May 18, 1980, hundreds of feet of sedimentary layers were laid down, but there's 30 feet of thousands of individual layers that were formed in hours. Those layers didn't take millions of years. Canyons were formed in a matter of days or months. Some canyons carved through hard rock by mud flows were formed in a matter of two or three years. He also talked about the Kaibab upwalk where it can go uh, to the Grand Canyon and, and the Grand Canyon cuts through a plateau the whole area was uplifted you can actually see where those rocks were uplifted they couldn't have been uplifted if they were millions of years old through heat and pressure they'd be broken you, you'd see uh, evidence of metamorphic processes uh, you don't see any of that they were uplifted while they were soft and when you look behind the Grand Canyon you see evidence there were once vast lakes the whole area was raised up in fact Psalm 104 seems to indicate how God entered the flood, raised up the mountains, lowered the ocean basins. That's why you find marine fossils on the top of the Himalayas, on top of Mount Everest, and marine fossils, because the area has been uplifted. Now, evolutionists say it happened over millions of years, but even looking here at the Grand Canyon, we realize that doesn't fit with the evidence. And when you have this uplift here, while the sediments were still soft, water's left over from the flood, rains after the flood, there's a dam, the dam breaks, it forms the Grand Canyon to allow the Colorado River to flow through. And there's lots of evidence that the Colorado River hasn't eroded over millions of years. Evidence even looking at the rapids, the amount of sediment that it even takes now. And you look downstream, you can see those surge deposits where that sediment was deposited. People, what you find out there as you look in geology totally fits with what you'd expect from a recent Earth, a global flood just a few thousand years ago. Isn't it exciting to be a Christian? Oh, that was a... 523 people excited. That, that was a lot better. So, then it comes down to looking at the Bible and people saying, okay, well, wait a minute. Because I've heard of lots of Christians and Christian leaders, churches that teach millions of years, and they say that the days of creation obviously allow for the millions of years. And so we need to deal with that issue, the days of creation. First of all, if those days are ordinary days, I'm going to tell you they are ordinary days, that the language gives you no option, but that they're ordinary days. But before we look at that, if they're six ordinary days 
And then you read those very detailed genealogies in the Bible. It tells you, for instance, that Adam had a son, Seth, when he was 130 years old. It tells you when people died and when they had uh, children and, and it specifies certain uh, sons there that were born. Actually, those genealogies in the Bible are very, very specific. And you can actually go through and add them all up. And if those days of creation are ordinary days, and then you go through the Bible and through those genealogies and then up to Christ and then to today, you don't come to millions of years. You only come to about 6,000 years. Now, there are many Christians that say, well, you can believe in millions of years and somehow you fit them in the days in Genesis or a gap between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. But I want you to understand something. You don't get millions of years from the Bible. That comes from outside the Bible, beliefs outside the Bible that many Christians have tried to impose on the Bible. If you believe in a young earth, as I do, as President Pettit does, as this university does, you'll be scoffed at. You'll be called anti-intellectual. You'll be called anti-academic. Uh, you'll be mocked at. And you know why? It, it's such an emotional issue. And unfortunately, many Christian leaders give in to that pressure. Because they don't want to be called anti-intellectual. You won't be published in what they call the mainstream secular journals. The evolutionists have to have millions of years. Think about this. We don't see matter producing new information. We don't see one kind changing into a different kind. How do you try and convince people that an impossible process of evolution occurs? Because we have these little changes that we see and that Darwin recognized, and they're within a kind, so you have to have an incomprehensible amount of time. That's why the millions of years issue is such an emotional issue. And evolutionists, they absolutely hate the fact that we believe in a young earth. You'll usually see when newspaper reports are written about people like us at Answers in Genesis, I can write, I usually tell the reporter, I'll write your first paragraph for you. These are the people that believe in a young earth and that dinosaurs live with people and we don't believe in evolution in millions of years. They're going to write that anyway, just put it down there. They, they are so emotional about the millions of years. Because if the millions of years is not true and the earth is only thousands of years old, the universe is only thousands of years old, what are they going to do? Believe the Bible? They don't want to do that because then they have to submit to God, to their creator. Now, when you take the Hebrew word for day, the word yom, for day, it's used 2,301 times in the singular and plural forms in the Old Testament. You know what's interesting to me? We know what the word day means everywhere it's used in the Old Testament except Genesis 1. You know why that is? Because Genesis 1 is where people try to fit the millions of years. See, the Hebrew word for day has a range of meanings just like the English word. For instance, if I uh, said, back in my father's day, it took 10 days to drive across the Australian outback during the day. There's the English word for day having three different meanings, right? Back in my father's day, time, 10 days, 10 24-hour days during the day, daylight portion of, of, of a day. The Hebrew word for day has a similar range of meanings. The Hebrew word can have a number of different meanings in the day of the Lord, in the time of the judges. By the way, the main meaning of the word day, even though it has a whole range of meanings, the main meaning is day. I knew you'd be surprised, but it is. And here's what you find with, with the Hebrew language. Whenever the word day is used with a number, 410 times outside of Genesis 1, it always means an ordinary day. When evening and morning are used with the word day, uh, well, without the word day, 38 times, that phrase actually means an ordinary day. When you have evening or morning with the word day, 23 times, this is outside of Genesis 1, it always means an ordinary day. Night with the word day means an ordinary day. In fact, let's have a look at, at, at Genesis here. Uh, for the first day, you've got night, evening, morning, number, day, evening, morning, number, day, second day, evening, morning, number, day, evening, morning, number. You know, it's, it's almost as if God is saying, look, you people who are so thick, I'm going to emphasize this over and over again so that you get it. And they still don't want to get it. And you know why you don't want to get it? Because if you took the Bible as written, it means six ordinary days, the millions of years is not true, and you're going to be scoffed at. Because the secularists have to have the millions of years. You know, and think about where our week comes from. Day, Earth's rotation. Month, Earth and moon. Year, Earth and sun. Where's the week come from? The Bible. Back to Genesis, the fourth commandment, based on Genesis 1, God made everything in six days. Now, if he made everything in six million years and the rest of a million years, it would be an interesting week. And, and, and if you happen to be in a church or a school or anyone teaches that, you can go to them and say, I didn't do my homework because I'm in the millions of years rest. I took what you said. 
then you can point out an inconsistency. But what about Christians who do believe in millions of years? Here's a major problem, and this is something that we need to really grasp hold of. They cannot ignore the teaching from the Bible on death. Do you know where the millions of years came from? It came out of atheism primarily, naturalism, deists who really, it's, it's not much different. But it came out of a belief of those who wanted to explain everything without God. And they said, all these fossils, they're not from the flood. They were laid down in layers over millions of years before man. Many Christians have said, okay, we'll take that millions of years and add it into the Bible. I want us to look at what the Bible says about the origin of death. Adam, you can eat of all the trees. There's one tree you're not to eat of as a test of obedience because he didn't make Adam to be a puppet. He wanted us to love him because he wanted to. You'll surely die. Adam ate the fruit. That's the origin of sin, that literal event of rebellion against God, original sin. And I would say that death is not just spiritual death, it's physical death. From dust you come to dust you're going to return. Not only that, I would say it's not just death of man. Romans 8 says the whole of creation groans because of Adam's sin. Because what did God do? Right back there in the Garden of Eden, he made tunics of skin and clothed them. Now, if you look around the room, you'll notice that everyone is wearing clothes. I'm very glad about that. You say, of course we're wearing clothes. But if you go to the zoo, the animals aren't wearing clothes. Evolutionists say we're just an animal. That's what Bill and I says. We're an animal. We're related to the animal. We evolve, we evolve from animals. Well, actually, we are an animal. We evolve from ape-like creatures. Why do we wear clothes? Incidentally, you know in a culture where people are rejecting the Bible more and more and say God does not have a right to tell us what to do and we don't believe the Bible, do you know what we're starting to see happening? People saying, why should we wear clothes? In fact, did you know there are demonstrations in various cities? A number of them have occurred in the last couple of years where there, there are women that get together and say, if men can walk around without their shirts, why can't we? And think about it. From a perspective of a secular worldview, why not? Why shouldn't they do anything they want to do? You see, the origin of clothes is in Genesis, and it's actually a picture of the gospel. It was the first blood sacrifices covering for their sin. God killed animals, clothed Adam and Eve in coats of skins. The first blood sacrifices are covering for their sin. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. No remission of sins. Why the shedding of blood? Because blood represents life. A man brought sin and death into the world. A man would have to pay the penalty for sin and death. There has to be the shedding of blood to pay the penalty for sin and death. But we're not related to the animals. So as the Bible says, it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So a man brought sin and death, a man would have to pay the penalty for sin and death. So it has to be one of us because we're all related to Adam. But it can't be one of us because we're all sinners. What did God do? He stepped into history in the person of his son to be the perfect man, to be our relative, to be of Adam's race. Wow. And died on a cross and shed his blood and conquered death, raised from the dead, and offers a free gift of salvation. Now think about this. If you believe in millions of years as a Christian, you've got a problem. Because then you've got death and bloodshed millions of years before sin. If without the shedding of blood there's no remission of sins, if there was a shedding of blood millions of years before sin, what has the shedding of blood got to do with the remission of sins? And in the fossil record, there's lots of examples of animals eating each other and bones in their stomachs. People, the Bible says originally... Adam and Eve ate, ate fruit. The animals were plant eaters. We we're all vegetarian to start with. We weren't told to eat meat until after the flood when God said, just as I gave you the plants, now I give you all things, everything. And that is, that's the justification for eating a hot dog because it is everything. <laughs> See, even the origin of a hot dog is in Genesis. Think about that. Did you know in the fossil record there are examples of diseases? There's a science called paleopathology, the, the, the study of diseases in the bones in the fossil record. And they see evidence of brain tumors and cancer and arthritis and abscesses. Now, wait a minute. If that all, all existed millions of years before man, if you take what the secularists have taught about millions of years and add into the Bible, this all occurred before man. After God created man, he said, everything I made is very good then God's calling brain tumors and cancer very good. 
You know one of the most asked questions today by young people, by the millennials? How can you Christians believe in a loving God? Look at all the death and suffering and all these children dying and starvation. Look at all the horrible things happening in the world. When you're taught millions of years, and most of our churches teach the kids you can believe in millions of years, most of our Christian institutions, the majority, by far the majority of Christian colleges, Bible colleges, seminaries teach millions of years. They don't hear at this institution, but the majority do. And when you teach generations of young people millions of years, you're telling them God's responsible for all this death, bloodshed and suffering and, and diseases in the world. No wonder they say, I, I, how can I believe in a God like that? They don't understand it's our fault because we sinned against a loving God. We committed high treason against the God of creation. And that's why the whole creation groans. And by the way, the secularists are so inconsistent. Oh, you Christians, if you believe in a loving God, look at all the people that drowned at the flood and all the rest of it, and he must be a horrible God. Wait a minute. If you believe in evolution and reject God, then evolution is responsible for all the horrible things we see in our world. Point that out to them. Did you know there are fossil thorns in the fossil record said to be hundreds of millions of years old? The Bible says thorns came after the curse. People, these two things can't be true at the same time. That's why the Bible calls death an enemy. It's an intrusion. The whole creation groans because of sin. But then we come down to the issue of the age of the earth. And people say, well, wait a minute. The secular scientists say the earth is billions of years old and they use all these dating methods. Most people don't realize that there are hundreds of dating methods you can use to age date things on the earth, but more than 90% of them contradict the billions of years. But you don't hear about those. And when, you, when you're talking to people who say to you, oh, yes, but but we know these fossils are billions of years old, or scientists have dated this. Ask them this question. What dating method did they use? What are the assumptions behind that dating method? Uh, tell me, explain to me how the dating method works. 99% of the time, people can't answer those questions. They have no idea. They just accept what they've heard on TV. I mean, today we're hearing a lot about fake news. I've got some more fake news for you. Evolution, millions of years, the dating methods prove millions of years. We've been hearing fake news for years. And ju just to show you, look, all dating methods have assumptions. All dating methods involve a process of change with time to try to calculate how old something is. But think about it. You've got to know what was there to start with. You've got to know everything that's happened in the meantime. See, salt comes into the ocean at a rate people can measure today. They, they can actually measure the oceans. That's observational science. And... And, and salt is taken out of the ocean, and there's a net gain of salt. So the oceans are becoming more salty every year. Now, the oceans are supposed to be 3 billion years old. If you assume the ocean started with no salt, and you say, how do you know that? That's the point. Every dating method has an assumption like that. You don't know. You weren't there. But if it had no salt, and if the salt's been building up in the past the same rate it is today, and you say, how do you know that? The point is you don't. But the point is every single dating method has assumptions like that. But if you take those assumptions, there's only enough salt to count for 62 million years, which totally contradicts the billions of years. But I don't believe it's 62 million years old. There could have been salt to start with. I think Noah's flood would have upset the amount of salt content in the oceans. It could be as young as 6,000 years. In fact, it is. There were some engineers in Australia, mining engineers, that drilled down into a basalt layer and they found some trees that were trapped, wood, woody material still trapped in the basalt layer. And when they dated, when the basalt layer was dated using potassium argon dating, it dated to 50, 45 million years old. When they dated the wood with carbon dating, it dated to 45,000 years old. 45,000 year old wood in 45 million year old basalt. There's a slight discrepancy there and it means there's problems. Look, when the lava dome formed on Mount St. Helens in, uh, in the 80s after it erupted, in the 90s, uh, a creation scientist actually sampled rock on the lava dome and used potassium argon dating to date the lava dome. That rock was formed in the 80s. Using the whole rock, it dated to 0.35 million years old. Using the mineral amphibole, it dated to 0.9 million years old. Using pyroxene concentrate, dated to 2.8 million years old. And you know what we found? Even in New Zealand, there, there were lava flows. We know when they formed. When you date them using potassium argon dating, it dates them millions of years. And you know what they found? 
when the, when the lava comes out of the ground from the mantle, it already has uh, a lot of argon in it, so it already looks old when it's not. But here's the point. When they know when a rock formed, they can figure out why the dating method didn't work. When they don't know when it formed, the dating method works. And even with carbon dating, see, you'll hear many people say, oh, carbon dating disproves the Bible. How many of you have heard, just as, a, just as an interesting question, how many of you heard someone say carbon dating proves millions of years or you've read that carbon dating proves millions of years? Put your hand up. Do you see all the hands across this room? Now, there's an example of real fake news for you. I'll tell you why. Carbon dating has nothing to do with millions of years. That's not me as a creationist saying that. It doesn't, has not, cannot. And any secularist who understands carbon dating will say it's got nothing to do with millions of years. See, you know what's happened? Because people don't understand the dating methods and they hear about carbon dating and they just automatically assume that's to do with millions of years. And so I've actually had pastors come to me and say, how can you be right about the age of the earth? Carbon dating disproves that. And how do I stand there and say, pastor, you're talking through your hat. You have no idea what you're talking about. You are just totally right. And they think it's me as a creationist saying that. I say, no, 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 you don't understand. The half-life of radioactive carbon-14 is 5,730 years. And after a, a, about 100,000 years, it would be not detectable. The point is, evolutionists know. Everyone, you can't use carbon dating for millions of years. And yet, the majority of the population think that's the proof for millions of years. It's mind-blowing. There were creation scientists that obtained some diamonds that are supposed to be one to two billion years old. Now, here's the point. If something is one to two billion years old and you try carbon dating, it won't work you, because it, it will not be, radioactive carbon will not be detectable after one to two billion years, and yet they find that they get a date of 58,000 years. You know what that means? They can't be billions of years old. And carbon dating has assumptions too. When it comes to astronomy, how come we still have comets? Because even for the long period comets, you know, after 10 million years, they, they'd be gone and, uh, you know, comets wear out, as you know. Well, what are, the, what are the evolutionists say? How come we got all these comets? Well, the, you've got the Kuiper belt and you've got the Oort cloud to give birth to comets. How do you know? Well, we got comets. There has to be a place out there giving birth to comets. How about the universe is not billions of years old? Oh, no, we can't have that. There's lots of other examples. The recession of the moon. The moon sp uh, moves away from the earth, spirals away from the earth. And so if you take the rate at which that is happening, it was only sl slightly closer to the earth 6,000 years ago. But the earth is supposed to be, uh, and, and moon, you know, I mean, you're looking at billions of years old. Wait a minute, that doesn't work. Spiral galaxies. The inner parts of the spiral galaxies, they, they rotate differently than the outer parts after millions of years that the spiral shouldn't exist. And, oh, they come up with all sorts of reasons as to possibly why that is so, to try to account for the millions of years, and they keep changing their reasons. The point is there's so much evidence like this. I, I can't give it all to you. We just don't have the time. But then we get on to, and I'm going to do this at the conference here, talk about the whole race issue. Where do all the different races of people come from? Now, people, think about this for a moment. If we all, if we all go back to Adam and Eve. 1 Corinthians 15, 45, Adam was the first man. Genesis 3, 20, Eve was the mother of all the living. If we all go back to Adam and Eve, how many races of people are there? One. There are no different races of people. And you know what else is interesting? People say, well, how did we get all the different, you know, the Australian Aborigines and the Fijians and, and the American Indians? Well, the Bible tells us there was an event called the Tower of Babel. God gave different languages. You know what happens? People move away from each other. And because of the incredible information in our genes, you end up with, with these characteristics that uh, are dominant in a particular group, but they're all minor characteristics. And we all go back to the Tower of Babel, back to Adam. Even skin color. People say, well, how do you get black people and white people? There are no black people. There are no white people. Now, I know people look at me and say, you're a white person. Okay. Let's do observational science. I'll prove to you I'm not. White. Me. <laughs> if I look like that, you'd be calling 911. Can you imagine that? What is your emergency? A white person is talking to us. Quick, we need help. Did you know we all have a pigment called melanin? You can have a lot of it, and you can have a little bit of it. 
there's no truly black people, there's no truly white people. We're all shades of brown. And it's just that genetic variability that we have. It's very easy to understand. It's a minor difference. And we try to major on that, but it's a minor difference. Let me show you a short video. I hear this one a lot. How can there be so many races in the world if we are all descendants of Adam and Eve? Well, check this out. First off, let's talk about the word race. Sometimes when people use the word, they mean supposed races of people who have evolved at different times, rates, and in different locations. That's not true. Of course, the word race is also a term we use to distinguish between groups with different physical traits, namely skin color. But are there really different races? Take a gander at Acts 17.26 where it is written that God, from one man, made every nation of men. It's clear then that the Bible teaches that there is one race, the human race. The Bible is also clear that all people on the earth are descendants of Adam and Eve who were created by God. Check Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Easy enough. God created two people in his image, male and female, and told them to increase in number. So Adam and Eve are mom and dad of the human race. Then their children had children, and those children had children, and so on and so forth for many generations until, according to Genesis 6, 9, the world's population was reduced to eight people who were protected inside an ark during a global flood. And those eight people later walked off the ark, and according to Genesis 9:19, from them came the people who were scattered over the earth. Oh, wait a second. What do I mean scattered? Well, jump over to Genesis 11, and let's talk about an event known as the Tower of Babel. Basically, because of the sinful actions of the descendants of Noah, the Lord confused their language and scattered them from there over all the earth. That's pretty clear and concise. Okay, so we've got lots of people who are descendants of the eight folks who came off the ark, and now they have been scattered all over the earth. That explains that we are still one race and that different groups of people ended up in different locations. But how do we get a bunch of different colored people if we are all one race? Well, follow along. This, of course, is a simplified explanation, but the basic principles are true. We all have a pigment in our bodies called melanin, which, depending on different variables, produces different shades of the one main skin color we all possess. Several genes control the amount of melanin produced and thus the variability in the skin shade. In fact, it's easy for one couple to produce a wide range of skin shade variability in just one generation, as we'll see in just a moment. Time for a quick genetics lesson. DNA is the molecule of heredity that is passed from parents to children. A child inherits 23 chromosomes from each parent. Each chromosome pair contains hundreds of genes which regulate the physical development of the child. However, to illustrate basic genetic principles pertaining to the topic, we'll just talk about two genes, the genes that control the production of melanin. So, let capital A and capital B symbolize versions of the gene that code for large amounts of melanin, while little a and little b code for small amounts. Got it? Easy. Check this out. Take a look at the upper left. Let's say dad contributes capital A, capital B genes, and mom contributes capital A, capital B genes as well. Together they will produce a child with capital A, capital A, capital B, and capital B. This is a kid with a lot of melanin, and thus he will have very dark skin. Easy to see. Here's the bigger point though. Let's say dad contributes capital A, capital B, and mom contributes little a and little b. Well, the child's skin will be middle brown shade, the combination of capital A, little a, and capital B, little b, which by the way represents a majority of the world's population. Not only that, but if each parent is capital A, little a, capital B, little b, the combinations that could be produced in their children could result in a very wide range of skin shades in just one generation. So. Since Adam and Eve were the first people ever, it makes sense to conclude that God placed in them a combination of genes that could produce all different shades of skin we see. Those same combinations would be present in Noah and the seven other people who boarded the ark. And because God dispersed people at the Tower of Babel, he dispersed the population, thereby isolating gene pools in the different people groups. Over time, different cultures formed in different locations with certain features like skin shade becoming predominant. And here we are today. And since we all go back to Noah and his family, it makes sense that we are all different shades of brown. One race, multiple people groups, just like the Bible teaches. Simplified for sure, but enough said. See, it's easy, isn't it? It really is. And I'm going to do that in more detail at one of the sessions here over the next three days. You know, it, it also changes your attitudes towards people. Have you, do you ever think like this? If you saw those riots in Berkeley just recently and realized every one of those people there, they're all my relatives. And probably many of them, most of them, don't know the Lord. Doesn't it make you think differently about every other person? They're my family. And it changes the way that you approach them. And you know, that brings us to the one last thing that I, that I want to finish up on. Why does it matter what Christians believe about Genesis? Because what I've been trying to show you is that, hey, and we could do it in a lot more detail, whether it's biology, whether it's geology, whether it's anthropology or astronomy, observational science confirms the Bible's history over and over again. And that history is foundational to our worldview, to our morality, to the gospel. When you take that history in Genesis, 
It says God made man in his own image. The animals weren't made in man's image. God was made in man's image. You know how many people think today? Abortion, get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids. We're all animals. What's the difference? No, humans are made in God's image. In fact, humans shouldn't even be in the animal kingdom. They're separate. We're different. And we need to emphasize that to our children. In the image of God created him, male and female created he them. I can tell that this that this university believes in Genesis because they have male restrooms and female restrooms. Who would have ever thought you'd have to talk about that? But think about it. When you abandon Genesis, if that history is not true, they'll define male and female however they want to define it. And the Bible tells us that God formed men of the dust of the ground. And then God brought the animals to Adam to name And he saw that he was alone. I mean, he didn't look at a female chimp and say, she's close enough, I'll date her. He realized that he was alone. And so what did God do? He put him to sleep. And from his side, from a rib, he made a woman. The first recorded words of Adam, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. She was taken out of man. And then, so the woman came from the man. Now, for those people who say, can't you believe in evolution and say God used evolution? Well, evolution would have us believe that man came from an ape man, woman from an ape woman. The Bible says man from dust and woman from his side. Even in the New Testament, Paul says a woman is of the man. And then verse 24, therefore, this is the reason... The fact that man was made from dust and woman from his side, and you become one because you're bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, you're one flesh. This is the reason a man leaves his father and mother and shall leave unto his wife, and they'll be one flesh. This is the reason for marriage. God made them male and female. He made us in the image of God, male and female, male from dust, woman from his side. You become one because you're one flesh. People, it can't be any clearer that marriage is a man and a woman. And... In chapel, in chapel in a few moments, when I speak in chapel, I'll go over this at one part, but I want to remind people, you know, Jesus in the New Testament quoted from Genesis when asked about marriage to say, haven't you read he made the male and female and said, this is the reason a man leaves his father and mother. The doctrine of marriage is founded in Genesis, not just marriage, by the way, but every single biblical doctrine of theology, directly or indirectly, is founded in the book of Genesis. Every single one. Once you abandon the history in Genesis and abandon God's word, anything goes, which is what we see happening in our culture. And you know, here's the bottom line. There are only two foundations upon which to build our worldview. It starts in Genesis. Trust God, you become like God. It's two religions battling, man's word, God's word. On the basis of man's word, moral relativism. On the basis of God's word, marriage, man and woman. Abortion, killing a human being. What do we see happening in our culture? The collapse of Christian morality, increasing moral relativism because increasingly we have generations of young people like yourselves that have been indoctrinated to believe the Bible is not true and that science has disproved the Bible. People, we need to get out there and get the truth to this culture. I encourage you to use our website, AnswersInGenesis.org, thousands of articles. You can spend millions of years on our website and uh, get some answers. Also, as a special for you, uh, we have these pocket guides over in Rota Eva Auditorium in the lobby. You can have them today for a dollar each. They're normally six dollars each. The two videos I showed you, the, the cartoon style ones, there's six of those animated ones that have some great teaching. The one about the race issue uh, and the other one I showed you, you can have that video today only for two dollars. We subsidize all these for you. And this one, Science Confirms the Bible, sort of similar to what I did this morning, done to a different group for two dollars. This book to present the gospel uh, to people starts in Genesis and goes all the way through. There's only $3. There, there's some really special subsidized prices for you. And then on the rest of the books that we have over there, you'll see you can get uh, different combinations, different prices. My book, The Lie, The Importance of the Book of Genesis, Why It Matters. That's, that's really our message in Answers in Genesis for the church. I'd love to see every young person read these four books, 130 of the top questions you'll be asked with detailed answers. Study those as a course Study those at home, and you'll be equipped to answer most of the questions you're going to hear about. Also, we just came out with uh, World Religions and Cults, Volume 1, 2, and 3. Volume 3 deals with atheism, secularism, materialism, 
how to understand these religions. Atheism is a religion and how to deal with them. Lots of other materials over there. I'll tell people more about those uh, as we go on. Also, I want to encourage the schools. You know, I, I, what I, one of the things that I'm saying is you can't Christianize secular material. It's either secular or Christian, which is why I really appreciate uh, BJU Press uh, Christian textbooks that stand on, on, on God's word right from Genesis. And, you know, I also uh, appreciate, too, that many... Uh, people here at uh, Bob Jones University, students are used as counsellors for Camp Infinity. We uh, actually partner with Camp Infinity. Uh, Dan Wooster, who was a, who was a, a computer pro a professor here for many years, it's a STEM camp uh, that people can go to, and counsellors from Bob Jones University are very uh, uh, from the university here very much involved uh, in Camp Infinity. If you want to go to a STEM camp that's creationist, I encourage you to look that up. With that, I'm going to hand back uh, to President Pettit. All right, thank you.